Well, that's what we desire. That's what we all want as Christians, as believers. We want to serve the Lord and be the Christian that the Lord saved us to be. And in Romans today, we have a very interesting passage here in chapter 7, verse 7 through 13, about the purpose of the law. And uh, we, from what we've done in the past here, the first six chapters and the first six verses of chapter 7, we could see why the law was given. And I don't know if you remember, uh, a year or so ago, we had a series in Sunday school, which we haven't had in a while, but we did the way of the master, it's called. Remember uh, Ray Comfort? The, he has a like kind of an English accent. He goes on the streets and evangelist and confronts people. And you know what he does? He, he uses the law. Paul's talking about the law here. And he says in verse 7, hey, what should we say then? Because he's saying that the law made sin exceeding sinful. So is the law a sin? And then he says again, as he said several times already, God forbid, had I, not, I had not known sin except for the law. So what Ron Comfort does is he uses what Psalm 19 verse 7 says, the law of the Lord. Again, these, there are synonyms for, for the Bible and for the Old Testament law, the commandments, the statutes, the ordinances. Well, he says in Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is, is perfect. We're going to see here, he says, the law is holy, Paul writes. It's just and it's good. Now, the law doesn't save you, all right? And we're going to see when he talked last time about a husband and a wife, remember, being divorced. If, uh, not divorced so much, but the spouse dies, there's death. Now he's freed. We're, we're, we've died with Christ. There's death has entered the picture, spiritually speaking. And now we're free as the woman that would be free or the man because of death of being a widow, free to marry it. It's not a sin. She's not, or he is not an adultery. And he's using that to compare what happens to us with the law. But without the law, he's going to say now, the purpose of the law is to bring us to Christ, to see that we can't keep it. Again, Psalm 19.7, the way of the master was based on that. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. What he does, again, and uh, we've learned that, is you give the law to a person, the Old Testament law, to show them their sinfulness. Uh, he'll always say to the person, well, you're a pretty good person, right? Yeah, I'm going to ask you a few questions. And he starts with the Ten Commandments, the law. He says, have you ever lied? You know, bear, bear false witness. Some people say, well, everybody's lied. Remember the tapes. And he said, well, what does that make you if you lie? And people are like, what do you mean? What does it make a liar? Yeah, I'm a liar. Okay, they'll say I'm a liar. And then he asks them, have you ever stolen anything? Well, I mean, maybe when I was a kid. Well, what does that make you? A thief. Then he says, have you ever looked at a woman and lusted? And he goes away where Jesus said, you know, you've heard in the Old Testament, you shall not have another man's wife. But then he goes a step further and says, if you even have a, a lustful thoughts in your heart, you've already committed adultery already. So he says to the person, by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving adulterer at heart. They broke in three out of the Ten Commandments. And you could see, remember, the person's countenance, their, their expression on their face, realizing they've broken the law. In other words, so you let, rather than argue with a person to salvation, you use the law. And Paul here gives a great uh, message about the purpose of the law, and it's clearly pointed out here. And so when you deal with people, it's not a bad thing to use. What Paul says is important to bring us to Christ, to see we can't keep the law. Everyone's broken the law and that we need a Savior. Amen? We need salvation. I want to look at a few points here. What, a question that he asked, point number one, is the law sin? Of course, we don't, we don't, we don't believe that. Uh, is it evil? Uh, no, it's not. He says here, look at verse 7 again. What shall we say then? Why is he saying and asking a question? Well, because in verse uh, 5 of chapter 7, look a couple of verses back. He said, when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, worked in our members to bring forth fruit. The, the end result of, of breaking the law and being a sinner, which that's what we are, all right? Now we're forgiven sinners, but before salvation, we were sinners that bore fruit unto death. The ultimate result of sin, the wages of sin, what? Death. And not just physical, but spiritual death, eternal separation. And so... Then he says here in verse 7, what shall we say then about the law? Is the law bad? Is it sin? And it's a legitimate question because of what, again, what he said before in the other verses. Like what? What did he say? Well, the law condemns us. <laughs> All right? Is the law sin? No, but it does condemn us. Where's that? Romans chapter 2, way back early on in our study. Romans 2.12 says, as many have sinned, and the law shall be judged by the law. And the law says, 
guilty because we've broken it. What else? The law uh, does not make a person a Christian. All right, uh, that was in Romans 2.29. He is a Jew, a believer, which is one inwardly. We talked about this ritual, remember the circumcision? He says, no, it's not the outward physical circumcision, but the circumcision or opening of a person's heart, he says. All right, and not the letter of the law, because no one could keep it. So the law judges and condemns. It doesn't make you a saved or a believer. Third, the law cannot make a man righteous and acceptable unto God. Romans 3.20, therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. We've been talking about justification, a main theme of Romans. Justification means when God looks at us now that we're saved, he sees us just as if we'd never sinned. We have the righteousness of not our own, but Christ's imputed unto us. Fourth, the purpose of the law is not to save a person, but to bear witness that we need the righteousness of Christ. All right? Uh, you say, where's that? It's in Romans 3.21. It says, but now the righteousness of God without the law, not in keeping the law, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ and all upon to all and upon all them that believe. There's no difference. Remember, no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the Jew and the non-Jew, all saved the same way. Another point, the law leads man to boast in himself. Well, what if Jesus was toughest on the supposed law keepers, the Pharisees, the strictest of all the Jews. Uh, he came to them and says, you're trying to, by your own righteousness, take away the righteousness of Christ. You go about doing your good works and good deeds to establish your own righteousness. And what did he tell them? You're like whited sepulchers. You're, you're, you look good on the outside, but you're full of dead men's bones. And that's what the law does. Uh, Paul said in Romans 3.27, where is your boasting? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? He says, no, but by the law of faith. That's how you get saved. Not by keeping the law. Keeping the law is not a bad thing. It's just when you use it for salvation. It's like we say about works. Good works you're to do after you're saved, because you're saved, not in order to be saved. They're, these are good things. The, the law, the Ten Commandments are good, but nobody could keep them. And if you're using that to, to go to heaven, you're not going, all right? No matter how good you think you are, it's only by Christ's righteousness. The law doesn't justify a person. He used, remember, Abraham in Romans chapter 4. The Jews, of course, one of their favorites beside Moses, Abraham. If Abraham were justified by works, it says in Romans 4, chapter 4, verse 2 through 5, he hath whereof to glory. In other words, if it was his works that saved him, remember it says in Ephesians, not by works of righteousness, but by his mercy, it says, and also we're not going to boast about it unless no one should boast. We're not going to go to heaven. And, Boy, I'm here because I really deserve to be here. No, we're going to be, I'm an undeserving sinner. I don't deserve to be here. But by God's grace, we're saved through faith. Gift of God, not of works. What? Lest any man should boast. But another point, the law is not the way a person receives the promises of God. Romans 4.13 for the promise that he should be uh, the heir to the, of the world was not to Abraham or see through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Faith, not your faith, the object of your faith. People say, oh, I'm, I'm a person of great faith. Terry was laughing at me because I always make fun of a person. It's not my voice. I'm just changing my voice to show you I didn't say that. That's what people say. And I'll... I'll <laughs> So I'll say, Terry, you said this to me yesterday. Do I talk like that? No, you don't talk like that, but you don't talk like me either. So that's not Terry's voice either. I don't know whose voice that is. It's this strange person in my head. The law <laughs> works wrath. The law works wrath. Why? Why? Somebody wants to do good, they want to keep the Ten Commandments. Yeah, because they're using that to get to heaven. The law works wrath in that it accuses us. It makes sin alive. Uh, he says here, you're going to see, if it wasn't for the law, I wouldn't know what sin was. <laughs> it condemns us because the law worketh wrath, Romans 4.15. For there is no law, then there's no transgression. If it said you, that we didn't have a law, you can't go through a red light, people would be driving around, they didn't know they broke the law because there's no law that says you have to stop at a red light. Same thing here. The law arouses men to sin. Yes. <laughs> because of the human nature we just learned this last week, Romans 7, 5. When we were in the flesh, Paul said, the motions of sin, which were by the law, worked in our members, our body, to bring forth fruit unto death. And so we could see 
uh, the, the, the question he asks here in verse uh, 7, what shall we say is the law sin, is a logical question because he's been talking about the law here. Well, is the law really bad then? No, it's not, because he answers the question, point two, right after that. The law reveals the fact of sin, the knowledge that there's sin, such a thing, the awareness of sin and its results. That what? I am a sinner. Look at verse 7 one more time. What shall we say then? Here's the question. Is the law sin? And he says, God forbid. No, no, nay. I had not known sin but by the law. I wouldn't even know I was a sinner. For I had not known lust, he says, or covetousness, except the law says thou shalt not covet. I wouldn't even know what I, that I was doing that or breaking the law, except there is a law that says not to do it. And so the laws of God are not evil, all right? It reveals the fact of sin. Apart from the law, he says there, I would not be aware that these acts are wrong, stealing and killing and lust. However, there would be much that, that a man could not know if he didn't have the law, much that he would desperately need to know and come to the Savior. The law reveals the fact of sin, the fact that men and women are not in a right relationship with God. Why? Because we can't keep it. We break the laws. Men are not in the right relationship with their fellow men. The Ten Commandments are either breaking them against God or breaking them against your fellow man. Men are living selfishly, the law tells us, dooming us. We're coveting, we're lusting, we're destroying our own world and our future. We're displeasing God, we're unacceptable. These, these are all things the law is supposed to show us so that we can come running to Christ for forgiveness and salvation and freedom. The point is this, when a man sees and understands the facts of sin, that we're sinners, then he can do something about it. What's the, the thing about all these 12-step uh, programs for people that are, have many addictions? They have to first say, first you have to understand you have a problem. You know, the thing is, you may say, well, obviously he knows he has a problem. No, they don't. <laughs> you talk to any uh, drug addict or alcoholic, they're, they're in denial. All right? Not a river in Egypt either. They, they, they don't believe they even have a problem. They think what they're doing is okay. They justify it. They justify losing their family, losing their jobs because of this powerful addiction of the flesh rather than say, wait a minute, I'm wrong and I'm going to try to correct it. And this is what the law does concerning sin in our hearts, that we need help. We need help. Without the law, we would roam in ignorance, not knowing what was wrong, what was right, what was uh, bondage, or what was freeing us. No restraints, everyone doing what's right in their own eyes, fulfilling their own desires, regardless of the, the hurt upon them and their family and everyone around them. You know, that's why when they have uh, these addiction programs, they have the whole family go, because it's not just the person addicted. Everyone that they are in their sphere of influence is affected by their, by their sin and, and what it does to them, and it affects the family. And so what happens when there's no law? We, we are a country, that's not my message here, right, based on what? The law. <laughs> Could you imagine a world, the United States, without law? Well, yeah, go to Seattle. Go to Chaz. What is it? It's called Chop Now going to change next week, another name. I hope they take it apart. They went there this week. Finally, the wimpy governor or mayor there says, you go in, we're going to disassemble it and take it down. Six blocks, I think it is, in Seattle. They went there with the bulldozer to get the cement blocks. You know, they, they built a wall <laughs> around the thing. How ironic. What happened? The guy, somebody had a gun. And the people that work for the city or whatever, the Department of Public Works says, look, we're not working here with somebody pointing a gun at us. I don't blame them. So what they do? They left. Well, we're going to go back in there eventually. You better pray for our country. There's people behind this thing using the, the terrible, terrible, the death of a man. It was terrible. The police did that. He's in jail. Who knows what's going to happen to him? And it was, it was wrong what he did. But they're using that crime and that terrible thing that happened to go all over the country now, using it to take our country down. They're trying to take our country down, the fact that we are the greatest country in the history of the world based on Judeo-Christian that they hate. You check it out. These are anarchists. They're communists. They're socialists. And they're using this poor man that was killed and his death 
to spread this hate all around the country. You check it out. Not only do they hate the president, they hate you and I. They hate anything that's true. They hate laws. They hate the police. That should tell you something is very serious. Do you hate the police? We were watching a video recently. Somebody uh, was in front of their store. I guess they had a gun saying, God, don't come near my business. I'll kill you. What did they say? The, the anarchist, call the police. Call the police. You're the one that said you don't want the police. Dial 911, I think is what they said, right? We saw that. Unbelievable. This world calls good evil and evil good. The Bible warned about all these things happening. It's happening in our generation. You know what, though? We have, there's no better time to tell people about the Lord, to use this, amen? To get out and say, and you know what? You're probably going to get people spit at you, throw the Bible at you, rip it up, and do all kinds of things that people have been doing anyway. They've always hated the Lord. They've always hated the gospel. This is not nothing new. It's just more out in the open now. And so take a stand. You don't have to be against anything. You know, if you're not for something, then you're a racist. You know that? That's ridiculous. If you're a Christian and you're a racist, you're not a good Christian. Right, let me say that right out in the open. We are one flesh. We are one blood. We're all of the human race. The people that are calling us racist are more racist than you'll ever be. And, and, and that's a fact. Now, the law awakens us to three things about sin. That it exists, that we are sinners. You know that I had that problem? I don't know if you did. I had it. The lady that came and witnessed to me, <laughs> Terry says I always talk about my salvation every time I preach. Why? I'm happy about it, amen? I'll never get over it. And she said, you're a sinner, Dr. Cuzo. And I said, I'm not a sinner. I thought a sinner was like some a criminal, degenerate, you know, murderer, slime bag. And I was. In God's eyes, your sin separates you from a holy God. God is holy, and we are certainly not, even though I thought I was a good person. And in man's eyes, maybe I was, but in God's eyes, disgusting sin. He says even your good things, all your righteousnesses are as what to God? Filthy, dirty, rotten, stinking rags. Because why? Because we're trying to take the place of what God did to allow us to come to Him. We're trying to do it in our own. And God doesn't like that. He says, I made a way. I made a way. I came to the world. I was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and died on the cross. And you're trying to tell me that by keeping the law, you can get to heaven without what I did? You're a sinner, and you deserve everything you get, yes? And the law revealed that. And the law reveals our sinful nature, that, that we... Uh, enjoy. We enjoy. People that are in sin enjoy their sin. I've had people say to me, I don't want to get saved. Why wouldn't you want to go to heaven instead of hell for all eternity? Because I enjoy my sin. I said, you're going to enjoy the results of your sin. You might not enjoy that, and you might not be punished here. Usually they are because of their sinful lifestyle brings disease and death. But eternal separation from God. Here's the thing. Well, I don't believe in God anyway. Well, you will someday. Man, it's too late, right? I like Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. I just skipped the whole page here because there's a, there's a lot of notes, right, Terry? <laughs> the law was our schoolmaster, the Bible says, to bring us unto Christ. That's the real purpose of the law, that we might be justified, looked at as perfect and righteous as Christ, justified by faith, not by works. You know, the schoolmaster was a, a person in, in the Jewish day in the Old Testament and early in the New Testament, it was like the nanny that washed the kids. And the schoolmaster was to take the kids to school, bring them. Well, the law is our schoolmaster, it says here, to bring us to Christ, to see we can't keep it. 1 Timothy 1.9 says this, Knowing this, that the law is not made for the righteous, but the lawless, the disobedient, the ungodly, and for sinners, which is all of us. For unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, and manslayers. The law makes lo the sin exceeding sinful to the point where we, by, again, our schoolmaster brings us. We run to Christ knowing that we can't keep the law. Third, the law gives sin the opportunity to be aroused, <laughs> working every kind of evil. Look at verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, by the law, he said, wrought in me. This is Paul writing now. All manner of evil. That word consuposence means evil. The law. For without the law, sin was dead. He, in other words, there was no law. I didn't know I was breaking the law. So I was doing everything I wanted to do. Everything. If it feels good, do it. You know, that kind of lifestyle. 
The words of Scripture here means, in verse 8, sin taking opportunity or occasion by the commandment works in men all manner of evil. Sin uses the law, the commandment. It's, the law is not sin. Sin's here. <laughs> where's, where's sin? Sin is not within the commandment, all right? It's separate. The commandment is not sinful. That's why he's saying, God forbid, is the law evil? Sin is within man, not within the law. And so man's uh, deteriorating, corrupt nature, we're sinners in our hearts. We were born sinners because of Adam and Eve's sin that separated us from God. And so we have by nature the principle of sin, the tendency to sin, the fondness for sin, the urge to sin, a sinful, fleshly body. Do you know that one of the three enemies of a Christian is your own body, the flesh, the world system, the flesh, and the devil. So your body, which will corrupt you and cause you, and again, it can't make you sin, but when you obey, Paul says, I make my body subject to me. I don't allow my body to tell me what to do. I tell my body what to do. And when you can do that, you have good control, amen? We've been talking about that for weeks, about having victory. Consider yourself reckoned. Remember the word, the old southern word. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, that it won't have any more power over us. But when we, before salvation, when we, we didn't know the law, we didn't know how sinful we were, and when people have said, you're a sinner, I said, no, I'm not. Uh, compared to what? <laughs> well, compared to God? Oh, well, that's a different story. We've all fallen short. Remember in Romans chapter 3? And everybody that explained to me before I was saved was like, God's the bullseye. He's perfect. And the darts there are people trying to live a good life, but we never hit the bulls to the mark. He's perfect. We can never be, no matter how good we think we are, we're never going to be the, the perfect, sinless holiness of God. And so, without the law, sin was dead. It wasn't active in us. But with the law, we see we're sinners. And not everybody, when they see they're a sinner, initially comes running to Christ. Well, they go sometimes deeper into their sin. <laughs> James gives a good progression of sin. James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. He said, every man is tempted. You're, you're tempted. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, men. But what? But without sin. Because he's God in flesh. But you're tempted. It says when he's drawn away of his own. Here's the sin in your own hearts. Lust. Well, the devil can tempt you all he wants. And, but your lust will pull you a little further. And then there's enticement. It's like the carrot in front of the horse thing. All right? It draws you away. Kind of like Solomon's wives drew him away from the true God, right? To worship their false gods. So there's temptation. You're drawn away by lust, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You're enticed. And if you go the next step, it says lust has conceived and brings forth sin. In other words, you, you've done it. Not only have you thought about the act, now you've done it. You've been enticed. You have your lust. You, in lust conceived, and the baby of, of the conception from lust is sin, the actual act. And then sin, when it's finished, the end result of it is always what? Bring it forth death. Not just spiritual death, being apart from Christ, being apart from God in hell forever and ever, the second death. But it causes sinful habits produce disease and death and corruption and misery and divorce. It's never a good thing, never a good thing. I've got to move here. Number four. That clock is going too fast back there. I think there's something wrong with the springs inside. The law reveals the fact of condemnation. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. You say, this is a bad thing, talking about all these terrible things. No, this is because of sin. Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Paul said, I was alive without the law once, alive to do whatever he wanted, right? But when the commandment came, when the laws came, sin revived and I died. Uh, but a good way, dead to the flesh, dead to the sin. And the commandment which was ordained to life, the laws, I found to be unto death. It was a good thing. A man that does not know the law feels alive. He doesn't pay attention to what he's doing wrong, all right? It, it's, we were all there before salvation, not knowing or caring about God's will, not caring about his word, not caring about church. We were ignorant. We didn't think of ourselves as sinners. There's no, therefore no guilt, no judgment, no punishment. We feel safe and confident and alive to do what we want to do. Don't tell me what to do, all right? A man who, know, who does know God, though, and knows the law, 
He sees sin come alive to him. Now he understands what it is. He becomes aware because of the law that he's broken it. And knowing the law, man becomes acutely aware of his sin when he breaks the law. It gives him an awareness, a guilt of his sin, a judgment to come, and a fear, yes, of death. (laughs) It's the law that causes his spirit, not the Holy Spirit, but the man's spirit to die. It destroys his confidence in himself, in his comfort, in his own sense of security in himself. Self-made man, you've heard people say that. The point is this, the law was ordained to bring life, but not in the way men prior to salvation think it. Men think that the law was given to be kept. And by keeping the commandments, they can earn their way to heaven, work their way to heaven. But this is not the way the law brings life to a man or a woman. The law brings life by destroying self-righteousness like the Pharisees. The law brings life by revealing the truth of sin and its, again, condemnation and judgment by God. It brings us to our true condition. In other words, we, we have to come to Christ spiritually bankrupt. I don't bring anything saying, Lord, I'm coming to you and, and all these good things for me to get saved. No, we're spiritually, we come bankrupt, empty-handed. All right, we're sinners. We deserve separation from God, eternal condemnation. That's what the law is meant to do, showing us we're corrupt, sinful, that we need a Savior. Amen. That's the good news. Pastor Sexton always says, there's no good news without the bad news first. I'm not going to drive and ask for directions when I think I know where I'm going. I have to be lost, especially men. Even when I'm lost, I don't like to stop and ask for directions. Because we're men. We know where we're going. Eventually, we'll end up there in the ocean, right, in Hawaii. But you, you have to stop. I'm lost. All right, Terry, I'm lost. Terry never even gives me a chance to get to that point. <laughs> She's like the living uh, GPS. When a man <laughs> looks at the law of God, he learns his true condition, that we're corrupted, destined to face an eternal death. Eternal death is just merely separation. See, all humans are made in God's image and likeness, so we have a soul that's eternal. So we're either going to be eternally separated or eternally with the Lord in heaven. I want to be eternally with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Five, the law reveals even the deceitfulness of sin. Look at verse 11, 7, 11. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, Paul says, and by it, it slew me. Sin takes the law and misuses it. It deceives us two ways. Sin misuses the law and deceives a person by making us feel safe and secure. The Pharisees thought they were going to heaven. They didn't like what Jesus was preaching against them because of They thought, we're keeping the law. We're keeping the law of Moses. (laughs) Sin misuses the law. That is self-righteousness. In other words, keep the law, you're going to be fine. I thought I was fine. I said, you know, we joke around, right? Who's going to go to heaven if I'm not going to go? I used to think to myself, you know what? What a lie that is. Man, I deserve it more than anybody. Paul said, Paul wrote most of the New Testament, said he was the chief of sinners. And you know what? We, we all are. When a man or woman looks honestly at the law, the law destroys the lies of the devil and the deceitfulness of sin. It's deceptive. That's why we tell our kids, be very careful. Sin, remember we said, will bring you further than you wanted to go, take you longer than you wanted to stay, make you pay more than you were willing to pay. That's what sin does. It's a lie. The devil is a liar and the father of it. And so is sin. I'm going to re- move on here. Number six, the law, however, and here's where it's good, reveals the way of God. It's the way of holiness, of righteousness, and goodness. That's verse 12. Wherefore, Paul says, he comes to that conclusion now in verse 12, the law is holy, the commands, holy, just, and good. That means when he says holy, that means the law is full of purity, majesty, and glory. All right, it reveals God's nature. It talks more about God than any of us. It sets apart and exposes sin, all that's contrary to God, all right, the law. The law is just, he says. It's fair, it means. It's impartial. It's straight. Third, the law is good. It shows man how to live. Again, not in order to be saved. There's nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. It's just we're not going to try to keep them in order to go to heaven because no one will because we're sinners. 
And then it brings me back to Psalm 19, verse 7. Again, the way of the Master. The law of the Lord is perfect. He says here it's holy and righteous and good. It converts the soul. Why? Because we can't keep it. It brings us to Christ. The testimony, another synonym for the law, for the, for the Word of God, is sure, making wise even the simple. Everyone. My last point, the law shows that sin is exceeding sinful and that it is the cause of death. It gets us to see when we understand the law and truly understand it. Again, as our schoolmaster, we run, <laughs> run to... <laughs> When a person understands that they're a sinner, when they can get that, when I got that in my head on July 8, 1982, when I could finally, you know, stop being proud, thinking I was good enough, when I got to the point and I saw what sin is and what it does, this woman must have read to me for like a half hour, 45 minutes, all verses, especially Romans, John, even the Old Testament about sin and what it does. I got to the point where I was like, wow, I'm a sinner. I, I need to be saved. And it was easy at that point. I wasn't arguing anymore. <laughs> and people won't if, if they're honest and see what they're gonna, what's going to happen apart from Christ eternally separated in hell. I was ready, in other words. But yet she had to do all this prior to that. That's why I don't like anybody saying, guy came up and just said, pre pre repeat after me these words and I'm saved. You know, they don't even understand what sin is. I don't have to go to a college class on salvation, but she spent time with me, this woman, and labored over me. After I got saved, you know what she told me? She says, the chiropractor that was here before you, he died of a heart attack, 51 years of age, Dr. Bruce Merritt from Wayne, New Jersey. Nice guy. Lost. He's in hell for all I know now. And she's a Christian, this woman. She said, I was a patient of his, and I prayed when he died that his blood is on my hands. This is what she told me after I got saved. So I'm listening to this like, <laughs> Wow. And she said, I made a vow that the next doctor that comes in here for this chiropractor that died, which is me, and I didn't know that. I was still in South Jersey at the time. I came to Florida, and she worked on me, this lady, because she made a vow to God that the next doctor that comes in, the next chiropractor, I'm going to witness to him, because she didn't witness to the first guy that died. Wow. I got saved. You think she was happy? <laughs> what she said? Answer the prayer! I uh, kept in touch with her. She moved from Florida to Delaware. And when I went into the ministry and got ordained to the gospel ministry, now this is 1982. I got saved. I was 27 years old. I didn't surrender to go into ministry until 47, 20 years later. But I called her. I said, Darlene is her name. I'm going to Crown College in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm going to go into the ministry. Oh! She was crying on the phone. She was so happy. You can be very happy when you tell someone they're a sinner, it's like you, you know, a lot of people are ashamed to talk to people about Christ because they don't want to give them the bad news. They have to get the bad news. I had to have the bad news. I had to know I was a sinner, and I had to know I can't keep the law, and I thought I was good, but I wasn't good. <laughs> the law shows sin exceeding sinful. This is my last point, verse 13, and we're done. Hey, I'm less than an hour. Thank you for praying for me. Romans seven thirteen. Paul said, was then that which is good... Made death unto me, the law? Again, he's asking the question like he did up in verse 7. God forbid again, sin, that it might appear sin. What it really is, working death in me by that which is good. That sin, by the commandment, by the laws, became what? Become exceeding sinful. First, the law is good. It's not the cause of death. God forbid. It's not the law that causes death. It's sin. Breaking the law. Second, the law was given to expose that and to make us aware of the consequences of sin. People today do things, why? They're not held accountable. There's no consequences. If people can go around, do whatever they want, and steal and loot and burn buildings down and beat up old people and stuff like that, I see some of the things on the TV. I want to jump through the TV screen, you know, like Captain America and do something about it. I don't like it at all. I don't care what the reason is. There's no justification for that. When we see the law and that we have broken it, you know what it says to me? Not that, uh, 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 it's okay because I've been treated bad. I'm a victim. It's okay that I broke. No, it's not okay. And no one's going to go to heaven because we're all lawbreakers. We've broken the law. And it made sin, not just aware that I'm a sinner, but exceeding sinful. The law was given to make men and women think about death. You know, when I do funerals, I say I like to do funerals more than weddings as a pastor. You know why? Because there's a body. 
I said, death, it's not a happy thing, but we use that to talk to people about Christ. Because now that it's on their mind and I really get into it, you know, the life is short, like James says, like a vapor. So-and-so here was just with us a few weeks ago. They're, they're not here anymore. And, and, and the person saved, I tell them, hey, they're in heaven, but there's a lot of funerals I do. I don't know. In fact, I know that they weren't saved. Those are the hardest ones to do. And I don't stand up there and tell them, she's in hell right now. I would never do that. Do I want to do that? But what we do is say, listen, what about you? You're going to die someday, and you're going to face a holy God. And so it makes sin exceeding sinful. It makes people think about that, that they're humans, and they're fragile, and life is brief. God gave the law so that sin and death would be exposed and out in the open more than ever before. We need to use it. Men had to be shown, I had to be shown, what great sinners we were, and that there's death because of sin, and not just the physical, but eternal death. That's the, the main one. Everybody's going to die, but are we going to die and be in, eternally with God, or are we going to die and be eternally separated? Those are the two choices. No purgatory here, right? The law shows men and women more clear than ever before. We're sinners, we're not perfect, and we're condemned to die, physically and spiritually. You've got you to got to tell them both points, and they need a Savior. And so we give them the bad news, but we always have the good news, amen? The great news, the greatest news ever. A Savior that will deliver them from the penalty of sin, which is death, hell, and the grave. And uh, the law shows us, again, our desperate need to be saved from that. That's the purpose of the law, and that's what we need to use. Like the way of the Master, which is one of the best plans to use, because you're not... It's, and they sell, say this, Brother John knows. You go around arguing with a person and reasoning, you bypass their intellect, and you go to their conscience. You give them law, it pricks their conscience. And we've seen it on video so many times. Have you ever watched this man, Ray Comfort? Watch him. Go to his website. He's got video after video. The latest one, I think, is on abortion and things like that, homosexuality. And he doesn't try to condemn them. He, he allows the law to do that. We're not to condemn anybody or judge anybody, but you know what? God's law does that. And when you give the law, it's like you could see their faces change. Again, he's not pointing his finger. and he's, I'm a sinner too. It's just unbelievable. And then he tells them what Jesus did. He took their place, all their sin and, and everything placed on him as our substitute and sacrifice. Now, have you trusted Christ? Have you been saved? You've been born again? Someone had to tell you first the bad news. <laughs> That you're on your way to a Christless eternity. We've all sinned and broken God's law. There's none, again, except the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he didn't come to, to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law, and he did. You accept by faith God's gift, love gift, of eternal life through Christ. That makes us acceptable. That's the only way. The only way a person can be accepted by God and go to heaven is through Christ's righteousness, not our own. So the law... God forbid it's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. If you use it the right way, it's a good thing to bring people to Christ. If you're here today, if you've never trusted Christ, we're going to sing a short hymn in a moment, and then we'll be allowing you to, to leave and go in the car and get that mask off and, and go home and have lunch. But if you've never been saved, talk to one of us after the song, after the service, maybe meet us outside privately, six feet, and uh, see you tonight either here or on uh, YouTube. And uh, God bless you. Think about all these things. Amen. Brother John.